And to introduce our panel and moderate our panel, I'm very honored to introduce um, the moderator, a former congressman and ambassador from New Hampshire who has served in, in multiple different capacities. And as I pull up his bio so you know just a little bit more, um, would you join me in welcoming Ambassador Dick Sweat, and he'll introduce the whole panel. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. As you can tell, I have been out on the campaign trail uh, yelling very loudly and losing my voice. But fortunately, I have a microphone, and as the moderator, I'm going to minimize my talking time and make sure that we can maximize uh, everybody on the panel's time. But first, I'm going to turn the microphone over to the gentleman who organized this panel. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to do this because Richard Polonsky um, formerly ran my North Country office up in Littleton when I was a member of Congress. And I've known Richard now, I hate to say, but it's been over 25 years. And uh, we have been fast friends ever since. And he has been very involved in very important um, issues. And uh, this most recent one with the New Hampshire Rebellion is one that uh, I certainly agree with him 100%. You're going to find out how all of us on the panel are strong supporters of what's going on. But Richard, why don't you come up and give us a lay of the land and then we'll get started. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm on the staff of uh, Open Democracy and... Back microphone. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm on the staff of Open Democracy and the panel is a, is, is a very interesting one because we're taking two major environmental projects or two projects, two energy projects with major uh, impacts on the environment and we're going to first talk about Northern Pass and how that has evolved. And the money that has been spent in lobbying for that is approaching two and a half million dollars. The other is Kinder Morgan's project to build a pipeline in the southern part of the state. Um, so I'm going to just turn it over to uh, the panelists and we'll start first with Jim Danis who uh, is a resident of Dalton, New Hampshire, and has been involved with this with the Northern Pass project since 2010. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> can you can you hear me? Is the mic on? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Northern Pass is. Uh, hear me? Okay. Northern Pass is a 1.6 billion dollar transmission line proposal that would basically take power from Hydro-Quebec in Quebec, Canada and bring it down to southern New England. It's 192 miles long. It would cross the state of New Hampshire almost entirely from top to bottom. There's a critical thing about this power line, which is it is a private for-profit transaction. So it's not like the line that goes to your house to allow you to turn your lights on. It's not like a transmission line that brings power up from a generation plant that's long-standing and electrifies the North Country. This is a private transaction designed to make money for Hydro-Quebec by creating a new market. There was a, a call yesterday by Eversource, I still call them PSNH because I've been around New Hampshire for a while. There was a call by Eversource PSNH where they talked about the project in the markets. They told us yesterday that by the end of this year, they will have spent $157 million on this project, even though not a single shovel has been put into the ground. All they've done with this money so far is to create a plan, to create influence, to continue the process um, by which they, they set all the pieces in place to get an approval and allow these profits to be made. Hydro-Quebec has announced to the public it will make $200 million a year in profit by selling power over this line. That is $8 billion in the course of 40 years. Eversource, call it PSNH, will make $100 million a year from this project. 
What's the issue? The issue is that every other private transmission line in our region, and there are many of them now proposed, will be 100% buried. So if you want to make money with a private transmission line in New York, or in Massachusetts, or in Maine, or in Vermont, the developers have agreed they'll bury the lines. It costs a little bit more, but they bury them to protect our environment. In New Hampshire, Hydro-Quebec and Eversource want to string most of this line above ground with towers up to 130 or 140 feet high. That is a very damaging environmental impact and property value impact. So let me just take a big step back and say what are the sort of bottom lines here. The bottom line as, as we see it from the North Country is that the federal approval process for this project is essentially captured. It's bought and paid for. We have two federal agencies that must approve the project. As far as we see it, they're simply going to approve it because they'll approve any new transmission, regardless of the public interest, and only by making sort of a gesture that they're listening to us. The state process, we also see as almost entirely captured. Uh, Northern Pass has nine lobbyists who work for them. They can seep through and influence Concord in ways that ordinary people can not. So we see the state process as essentially bought and paid for as well. Um, the opposition is a citizen's opposition. It's not organized. There's no sort of committee that says how things are done or sets the rules. People do what they should do, and Rob will speak about what Concord has done. The citizen's opposition has had two major successes so far. Number one, um, they took away the right uh, by legislation for this line to use eminent domain to seize property. And number two, <laughs> number, <laughs> and, and Brian, Brian Tilton played a big role in that. Thank you, Brian. And number two, uh, Northern Pass has now agreed to bury this line in part around the White Mountain National Forest. Those are the two successes. There are many more fights to be had. Um, we've been at this now for five years and we expect to be at it for five more years. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Rob Werner, uh, who was referenced in the first uh, panelist's remarks. Rob serves on the Concord City Council. He also has other responsibilities um, in, envir in the environmental NGO sector. I'll let him tell you about a little bit about his background, and then more importantly, he's gonna share his perspective and what is happening on the on the Concord City Council with regard to the Northern uh, Pass Pipeline. Rob? All right, thanks, Dick. So, um, I think that many of you know that with this project that, that uh, Concord is one of the more affected communities uh, in the path of the project. Um, Appalachian Mountain Club report references that. The towers have to be particularly high in Concord uh, because of the aspect of uh, transmission at that point. It does use the existing right away for those that are uh, familiar with the Steeplegate Mall area and the towers that are there now. So if you envision driving down Loudoun Road in Concord and see the approximately 60, 70 foot towers that are presently there, envision them to be twice as high. And that is a, a great concern to that area, and it's, an, it's a great concern to some developments that uh, would be very affected as the line moves through Concord. Um, the Concord City Council, uh, a number of months ago, we voted to convene a special committee to uh, get input from Concord residents. We did have a number of public hearings. Uh, Eversource uh, was certainly represented. The Forest Society was represented. Appalachian Mountain Club, other groups that have perspective uh, on the project uh, were represented and made comment. But the most important group of comments really came from the citizens of Concord, who loudly and clearly said, uh, very consistent with uh, most of the folks on, most of my colleagues, that we want this project buried. I mean, two years ago, our city manager, Tom Aspel, wrote to this, uh, energy, uh, the Department of Energy when they were having their initial hearings that to, inf 
reflecting the work done by our conservation commission um, that they uh, that we would want this project if it went forward to be buried within the confines of Concord um, that's really you know what what we can do in terms of a public statement and and Concord does have a continuing representation um, with the site evaluation committee as an intervener um, so we're doing all we can to educate folks in Concord ab about this. Um, it's interesting to me that um, a couple of years ago, and I think things have changed markedly in terms of public perception within Concord and Concord area, when we first really started talking about Northern Pass from a Concord perspective, there were a lot of people in the city that said, well, I'm not really sure how it affects Concord because it seems to me that it's a Northern New Hampshire issue. Obviously, they had seen all of the publicity and, and the agitation uh, in the North Country from where my colleague here lives. But people didn't really have an appreciation until relatively recently in terms of the impact of this project on the city of Concord. Um, so, you know, we as a, as a city council um, have weighed in. Most of the other communities along the path of the project have weighed in asking for uh, this project to be buried. The city of Franklin, uh, notably, uh, is on the other side of the issue. Um, they get the generation of revenue from the, the terminus of this project, so they have a little different perspective. But most of the other communities have, either through, through town meeting or some other type of expression, uh, stated their opposition of the project as currently proposed. Um, I think that the connection with money and politics is truly significant in terms of the amount of money that's been spent and the amount of uh, effort that's been made to really try to uh, communicate public support for this project, which if you look at polling uh, that is done by UNH, it's, it's either very split or in opposition. As people learn more about the project, they tend to become more opposed to it. But was one of the things that is a, a classic sort of strategy of uh, sort of political uh, involvement in these kinds of projects and, and a PR aspect is what's called, uh, in political terms, astroturfing. And I think that Northern Pass is uh, very heavily engaged in that strategy. Trying to, and what, what that means is, you know, using uh, a high amount of resources, PR, advertising, trying to um, use uh, community uh, folks on the local level to uh, express support for a project that doesn't really exist. It's, AstroTurf is the, app, is the opposite of grassroots. AstroTurf means you know, highly funded, not necessarily a lot of support for uh, what you're trying to propose. Grassroots, obviously. Uh, so often is the opposite. A lot of public support, not particularly well funded. Um, so, you know, in 2014, uh, just in the New Hampshire legislature uh, and policy, uh, other parts of state government alone, uh, Eversource has spent nearly $600,000 on, on lobbying. But they have also spent thousands more in terms of uh, contributions to uh, uh, elected officials, the campaigns, and so forth. So, this is a multi-pronged process, multi-pronged strategy on the, on the part of uh, Eversource. And one other thing that I'll mention, um, one of the things that they have tried to do is to put this project in the context of a lot of job creation. <laughs> um, early on, uh, there were a lot of internet pop-up ads and, uh, and, and the like around how they were going to create thousands of jobs through the construction of this project. The problem was it, it was a it was misleading in the terms of saying, well, where are those jobs and when are they going to occur? Um, if the project goes forward, uh, these jobs would not come online until maybe 2018, 2019, in the best case scenario of the time. But they seem to be advertising this now as a as a true concurrent now benefit to New Hampshire. Not quite accurate. So I think that they are trying to put this project in the best light possible, spending quite a lot of resources trying to influence the process. But we as communities along the path of the project are, will continue to uh, fight hard to make our views known 
and as the site evaluation process continues and through our integrator status and that we'll just continue to to make sure that our views are are front and center and that we can try to influence the ultimate outcome thank you very much rob We will now hear from David Maloney, who is a citizen from New Hampshire living in Hollis, and he is going to bring his perspective on the work that he has been involved in with regard to the natural gas pipeline. So, David, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Um, so, this uh, work that I'm involved with is, is called, the, the project is called the Northeast Energy Direct Pipeline Project. It's being... Um, put together by a, a company called Tennessee Gas Pipeline. The owner of Tennessee Gas Pipeline is Kinder Morgan. They are the fourth largest energy company in the United States. Um, they uh, have they uh, made the proposal for this back in 2012 in Massachusetts. It was originally going to go almost pre completely through Massachusetts. Uh, there was a lateral across, and this is a, a transmission line, I should say. Um, it's a um, transmission line uh, it goes at about 1,400 PSI um, in terms of uh, the pressure that runs through this pipe. Uh, it's going to start in, um, in, in New York, uh, in a town called Wright, Wright, New York, and it's going to go now uh, in, in its new route about 70 miles through Massachusetts and then about 60 some odd miles through New Hampshire. And it, its destination is uh, Dracut, Massachusetts. So it'll come up through Western Mass into New Hampshire, pretty much across all, of, all through Southern New Hampshire and then find its destination in Dracut. From Dracut, um, which is a hub, it can be distributed in many directions. It can be distributed down through Massachusetts up through New Hampshire, through Maine, and uh, there is a direct connection to um, export terminals uh, in Nova Scotia and uh, New Brunswick. Uh, so that's the project. Um, it has, I guess I, you know, um, like to talk a little bit about how it contrasts with Northern Pass and how it uh, is similar. Um, Captured? Absolutely. Uh, there is a, uh, regulatory capture is the biggest problem with this pipeline. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, if you've not heard of that commission, you should. Um, some people are familiar with it because of, uh, the, you know, the work that was done with Keystone XL. If you were involved in that at any level, you may be familiar with that uh, regulatory agency. But it is... Um, uh, uh, like, I guess like all agencies, um, it has its own um, uh, very uh, interesting mechanisms. It doesn't pick winners and losers in the marketplace. It just simply decides that if you have contracts, you must be, um, you know, the public must need you. Um, I don't know how that <laughs> equation squares with you, but it doesn't square very well with me. It seems to me there's far more dimensions to how you determine need than whether you have a contract with a company or not. Um, uh, it has rubber stamped every project that it has ever been asked to permit except one. And that one permit that it did not provide was through a, uh, a coral reef in Florida. Uh, it segments um, all of the work that it does, um, you know, into individual pipeline projects as opposed to looking at them together collectively. So, um, and uh, there's a lot more, but um, in terms of, ca so, so it really is a, ca a captured scenario that we're in. Um, one other contrast is this difference between federal versus state. So where much of what's going on with Northern Pass is a state level issue and the site evaluation committee in New Hampshire has ultimate authority over its approval or not, it's just the opposite in our case. Uh, in our case, the site evaluation committee has been asked to weigh in. Um, ultimately, whatever the site evaluation committee in New Hampshire decides, there is the supremacy uh, clause in our constitution that says, and the commerce clause in our constitution that provides uh, uh, the power to usurp those uh, rulings at the state level to the federal level. And the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission 
uh, once this project is approved, if it is, uh, is in in uh, the, their job effectively is to expedite the permitting process. Um, that is their that is their actual job. So. Um, I guess that's all. Uh, in terms of um, you know the difference between the two, that's what I'd say. Um, and we also have this astroturf issue, which was discussed. Um, there is a group called the um, Coalition to Lower Energy Prices. Uh, it's an astroturf group. Um, <laughs> it's it's got uh, some very interesting characters in it. A lawyer. Uh, a a uh, um, educational wing um, uh, policy setting division, etc. And um, uh, it's um, it's it's you know not actually consist. It doesn't actually consist of citizens, though its name says that it does. Uh, it, it consists of um, people who, one of which was the Under Secretary of Energy in Massachusetts. And uh, also sits uh, as a uh, um, uh, teacher uh, uh, department head at Tufts University, and had the audacity at a meeting that I went to in, at the University of Massachusetts to literally say that the problem of energy in, in New England boils down to one issue: we need a 2.2 billion cubic feet pipe to come through New England and all our energy problems will be solved. <laughs> uh, this project is a 2.2 billion cubic feet project. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. What I'd like to do at this point, we'll give him a hand. What I would like to do at this point as the moderator is to first take a few minutes to talk about the technical aspects and just draw out the similarities and differences a little bit more. And I'm going to tell you a brief story to, to help set that stage. And then the remainder of the morning's discussion, um, which I hope will be somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes, will be to talk about the, the astroturfing aspect, the lobbying aspect of these projects. And the story that I'd like to tell you really is about the... the um, uh, the, the birth of the political awareness in my life uh, because I started out as an architect and one of the things that I did was I was a developer of alternative energy, renewable energy power plants here in New Hampshire back in the 80s. Now many of you may recall that back in the 80s we had no discussion about polar ice cap melting or global warming. Um, and so this was a very difficult thing to do. And what I learned from this experience was that there is incredible forces within the utilities that were starting to, get, to grasp the, the kind of, of power that they could uh, have to control this system along the lines that our panelists have been describing. But more importantly, I had one particular uh, experience that I thought was very instructive, and that was how the, the Bo Merrimack station um, was originally sited. They originally wanted to site that project in the town of, of uh, Pembroke. And uh, when they went to Pembroke and they, they asked the, the town fathers um, if that could take place, um, the town was receptive until one thing occurred, and that was that they discovered that the, the, the pollution, the soot from the uh, smokestack, and you have to remember this is back in the 60s, the soot from the, the, from the smokestack would, would be distributed downwind across the entire town, and so that you would literally wake up in the morning and be able to take your finger and, and get a black smudge off of the soot that was on the, on the top of your car or any of your property. And so the town decided that they did not want the station located in Pembroke. So what did PSNH Eversource do at that time? They then relocated the, the site across the Merrimack River because they needed the water resources of the river and put it in the town of Bow. Now, what happened in Bow? Bow accepted the um, application, the, t the facility was built, but what happened? The downwind carrying of that soot carried that wind, carried that soot downwind over the town of Pembroke, and Pembroke ended up getting the soot on their cars just the same. And what that pointed out to me were two things. One, 
that there needs to be a broader coalition of people involved in watching how these projects are developed. And number two, that we needed to develop renewable resources, renewable energy in New Hampshire that was totally dependent on the local economy and the local geography. And that's why I got into the business at that time. Now what we're seeing are these projects that are either bringing in clean renewable energy such as hydropower but from outside the state or outside the country in Hydro-Quebec or we are bringing in yet another fossil fuel that will be implementing and distributing that natural gas in the marketplace here in New Hampshire. The first question on the technical side that I want to ask the panelists is in the case of the of the Northern Pass pipeline, what would happen, Jim, if, well, first of all, I'm assuming that you have enough background information to be able to share with us the economics of having that pipeline fully um, put underground and also sized with enough capacity so that our own natural resources like the biomass facilities that we can produce in this state could actually use that north-south transfer of that, product, that uh, produced energy to um, meet the demands of New Hampshire's energy supply. Because my feeling is, is that we want New Hampshire to be totally independent. So if you could address those two issues sure. and then we'll move on to uh, yeah. the next one. Yeah, Dick, that's a, that's a great point. And let me take the second one first. And Dick's question is, well, so we're building this great big new transmission line how can New Hampshire Renewables business take advantage of it? Answer, you cannot. This transmission line is built, how can, what's an analogy? Like an elevated rail line in, through a city that doesn't actually have any stairs going up to it. So basically it runs right through you and it goes to all these places you might want to go, but you can't wa walk up to it and get on. Literally, this line is unavailable to any producer of New Hampshire power to move that power elsewhere in New Hampshire or to other markets. Why? Because Hydro-Quebec has bought and paid for 100% of the capacity. Dick's second question was, well, what does it cost to bury the line? Interestingly, in the federal and New Hampshire political process, um, there has yet to be any politician or agency who has forced a clear answer to that question, which I personally think is a travesty. So we're relying on estimates provided by Northern Pass and their consultants and sort of back in the of the envelope calculations. Northern Pass says it would cost an additional billion dollars. Um, a lot of us who've looked at the numbers think it would cost maybe an additional 500 to 600 million dollars. The bottom line is, if you were to take the return that FERC has allocated to Eversource, and picking up on Dave's point, FERC, all FERC wants to do is say, give a lot of money to developers. FERC has allocated, get this, a 12.56% profit margin to Eversource. So you put money in, the money's guaranteed by Hydro-Quebec, and Eversource will collect a toll of 12.5%. My savings account doesn't get near to 12.5%. I don't think anybody earns 12.5% these days. You're giving Eversource 12.5% ultimately out of the people's pockets to facilitate this transaction. So is it affordable to bury? It's absolutely affordable to bury. Just knock that rate of return down to something the market would say is sensible, like 10% or 9%, and you can bury it. That's the point that I was trying to bring out. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, and what we need to understand is, so if we have the extra capacity, if we can bury this and it's economically feasible, this project could possibly go through and could have a benefit to the northern, uh, northeastern region. In the case of, of David's um, interaction on the project, on the, on the pipeline project, there's a different quality to it because he's dealing with a project that has the uh, natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, which continues our dependency on fossil fuel production. David, um, talk to us about the, um, the factors that are c creating public uh, discourse around the pipeline project that you're involved in, and is that due to the kind of fuel that's being moved, or are there other reasons that um, are at the root of the opposition? So the opposition uh, 
is against um, the, the opposition is on many levels. We have a local level opposition, which is um, effectively 20 towns in southern New Hampshire that are affected by this pipeline project, one of which is going to get a compressor station, which has enormous problems in terms of health risk. Uh, and so that's a local issue. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know what it's going to do for our uh, energy economy and our future. Um, yes, I mean I. I, I tend to look at this in uh, very global terms. I think in terms of paradigm shifts. We had a paradigm shift that went from wood to uh, coal years ago. It then went from coal to oil and now we're faced with a situation where we're either going to go from coal, uh, oil to gas and then to renewables or we're going to go from oil you know, this sort of bridge idea, this bridge notion about gas, and then to renewables, how are we gonna do that? And really, honestly, it comes down to, uh, we can't afford it. We honestly, as a, as a country, as a nation, as a world, there is no chance for us to afford that transition because each one of these transitions takes about 30 years to implement and what what the pipeline company is trying to do is establish that 30-year infrastructure that will bring them out of coal and into uh, gas another thing to keep in mind the price of oil right now four hundred forty dollars less than forty dollars a barrel at forty dollars a barrel it essentially has a price equivalent to gas that makes it just as economical to burn as gas does. So there's no longer a price advantage under the current market. And what we see, um, one other parallel I wanted to make to uh, the Northern Pass project is that much like the Northern Pass project, this uh, much of the capacity of this project is designed to pass through New Hampshire, through New England, not to New England. Yes, there are people who are signed up for capacity. At the moment, that capacity is at exactly half the size of the pipe. So the rest of that pipe is, and, and the 50%, because we don't use it all year long, it's basically over, uh, over capacity, a massive over capacity, and massive underutilization of a very large pipe that we're going to pay for. Thank you very much, and, and it sort of adds to the very good analogy that Jim gave us of the elevated rail that runs through New Hampshire with no stops in New Hampshire, so we have no ability to have access to that rail. I'd like to ask a question now with Rob, who is coming from the, the public representation side of things. He serves in Concord on the Concord Council, but what I think he also has a very good sense of because of his other job with the League of Conservation Voters is how have communities been able to unite and in that unity, do they have the same voice as the uh, lobbyists who are working for these projects? And Rob, if you could give us a little bit of background on, on how much influence you are able to engender as a public citizen representing the city that you serve and how you, you can coordinate with other communities. Um, is that actually an effective way of working or are there problems with that that you're um, seeing a real need to be addressed? Well, I think the, the largest limitation that we have as communities is that we don't have direct control over approval of the project. We can make our opinion known and uh, we've done it very strongly as uh, most other communities, as I mentioned, along the path have done. Um, I think the uh, organized opposition, particularly in the North Country, has been quite effective in terms of getting the project parameters known to the general public and I think influencing public opinion that way. But at the end of the day, uh, we are very much outgunned in terms of the resources that are on the other side. And, you know, so we're really needing to rely on um, a process in which, frankly, I, we can state a strong opinion, but we don't have ultimate control over it or decision-making authority over it. So it is a, you know, it's a difficult situation to be in, uh, but we will continue to to fight on that and try to get the, the word out. You know, I want to take a, a, a second to add to the technical aspect. I mean, burying this project is certainly not a technical issue. Look at projects that are happening in other parts of the region. You know, particularly the project 
coming down from Hydro Quebec to New York City through Vermont. That's going to be buried the entire way. Part of it's going under Lake Champlain. So it is not certainly not a technical problem. Uh, Northern Pass states that uh, you know burying this project would you know be a non-starter in terms of uh, the cost to consumers. But even if it was, it is it is more expensive. But as been pointed out, it's marginally more expensive. And isn't that worth, you know, preserving our uh, way of life and the economy that we rely on? And you know, what makes New Hampshire uh, New Hampshire? It makes us special. I think it, I think it certainly is. So uh, don't be fooled by um, all of the uh, uh, PR that is coming out of. Out of uh, the, the folks who want to, to push this project. You know, so, uh, there was a state senator who said, you know, it's like running an extension cord from Hydro Quebec from Canada down to Connecticut. You know, and we don't benefit. So uh, that, that certainly is a big problem. But you know, the bottom line is, to answer your question, we, we, we are outgunned. We need uh, uh, more organized opposition. I think you know the groups like the Forest Society, Appalachian Mountain Club have done very good work. But at the end of the day, I think it points out, in terms of a, a real imbalance of, of political power and, and authority in the process, to to make our opposition stick. Thank you very so. much, Rob. And unfortunately, we've been given a five-minute warning, so we are going to have to conclude this panel's discussion at this time but what i would like to do is in that conclusion give each of the panelists an opportunity we've heard of two projects we've heard of three pr perspectives on those projects we've also heard what the challenge is and obviously one solution could be that we have to have as much money as as the lobbyists and we uh, have that money to use in order to raise our voices i don't think that is in a, a reasonable a possible or even appropriate approach. I think what we really are going to have to do is what New Hampshire Rebellion is very much engaged in, and that is to reform the process so that everybody has an equal voice in that process. And I'd like to end this discussion with a positive comment and some constructive remarks from the panel talking about how they see that can be accomplished based on the experience that they've had with these two projects. And we'll start with David and move our way down the line. Okay. Um, well, in our case, uh, the process is, is trying to overcome, uh, you know, people's ability to get heard by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. There is really no voice for people. Uh, people who are affected by the project uh, have the most voice, but there's a trap being set for them. The trap is that you divulge information about your, whatever your particular situation is, and your your information becomes sort of uh, intelligence uh, for you know the the pipeline company and for the regulatory body that's going to protect them uh, in order to you know uh, provi provide an atmosphere where they can litigate whether they care about your concern. It's a little bit of like when uh, you know the the car industry decides whether they're going to put a device in the car or not based on whether it's going to affect their profit margin one way or another. If it's going to obviously cause enough harm, that'll affect their bottom line. If it doesn't, then you know and they put the implementation that put the device in then hopefully that will affect their bottom line pot as a positively. All of the what is called mitigation effects uh, for the pipeline are about you know whether you know what they can get away with and what they're able to avoid having to be a uh, cost for the pipeline project itself. So um, really having people get a voice in that process is very much what we're all about and we work that through legislators, we work that through um, coming up with different ideas on how to slow down the process through um, bills in, in New Hampshire. And also, uh, we've, we've talked to our delegations in uh, the US Congress, our senators, and um, all of which are responsive to this idea. Even Hillary Clinton has come out and said that the FERC process uh, needs reform. So we've got everybody talking about it, and now we really just need to have something done about it because, um, you know, exposing them for what the fraud that they really are uh, is really what this is about. You know, uh, one project uh, in its entire gas pipeline permitting history has been, uh, you know, denied 
its access. Um, that's not a regulatory body. I don't know what that is, but it's certainly not a regulatory body. And um, to be able to start looking at these projects from a, a more jaundiced perspective is really what this is all about. This is this particular project is about expansion into export markets. It has nothing to do with you know people in New Hampshire. You're not getting gas at your home if you live in a remote area. Trust me. Um, you know your gas prices are not going to go down. The Tennessee gas pipeline president says your gas your rate for one year is going to go down four hundred and thirty seven dollars. I can tell you that the capacity costs that are going to be required for each of you to pay into your rates is going to be more than six hundred dollars a year. So the net average is you're going to lose money. Will the price of gas come down? Possibly. Can the pipeline company guarantee it? Can anybody guarantee it? Absolutely not. Thank you very much. And now, Rob? Sure. So, thanks, Fergan. Um, even in the face of what I was describing in terms of the disadvantage we have, there has been successes. I mean, you will call that the congressional delegation, uh, most members of the congressional delegation, have consistently expressed skepticism about the Northern Pass project and wanting more information. That's a positive development. But I think part of that is really due to the political pressure that's been put upon them. And it's also true on the state legislative side. I think uh, the optimism that I have uh, uh, for the project uh, ultimately being buried is is just to keep at it in terms of getting the information out there, the correct information, trying to really dig out cost estimates as to what it would be to be buried, get that out there, keep the pressure on the political process, and outlast them. Uh, ultimately, if Northern Pass decided that yes, we don't want years and years and years of delay and, uh, with this project and decided that they want, you know, they respond to the desire of the folks in New Hampshire and the political process that yes, we will bury this project now. The opposition to it would dissipate very rapidly on a bipartisan basis. Um, we can talk about sort of the, the actual need for the project, the actual need for the extra capacity in the long term, but if they were to do that, the project would proceed rather quickly. And maybe we can get to that point uh, where they make that decision if we just keep the pressure on and can frankly outlast them. Thank you very much, Rob, and now Jim. <clears throat> I'll keep it to just one point in the interest of time. New Hampshire and the federal government have a form of legalized bribery. The word is mitigation. It's four syllables. It's a big word. What it means is that a project like Northern Pass can come and say, um, I'd like to do it the way I want to do it, but here, I'm going to hand you some of this. I'm going to hand you some money. I'm going to hand you some land. I'm going to hand you some benefits. They hand out money in order to buy an approval. That's not the way people describe it in polite company, but that's how it works. What I would do uh, in order to have a more optimistic future, I would have a new law that says, for purposes of approval of siting of projects, um, mitigation shall not be considered. Projects shall be evaluated based on their direct impacts, and you can't buy your way out of it. I would like to take this opportunity to thank, first and foremost, all of you in the audience for attending and listening to this discussion. This is a very important one. I will give you one bit of uh, hopeful uh, information out of Washington, and that is that there's an organization of, of former members of Congress and, and members of the Senate and House that is called uh, Reformers. And the Reformers are a bipartisan coalition of over 140 former members who are trying to take a fight on these particular issues of money influencing in public um, programs and policies and, and to change that. We first and foremost are trying to uh, create more transparency so that all of you and all of the panelists know exactly where the money is coming from, who it's coming from and where it's being spent and what is being expected in that expenditure. But more importantly, this group of reformers, like all of you in New Hampshire Rebellion and the folks who are dealing with all of the issues with regard to campaign finance reform, this is a very important topic that has to be continued not only throughout the campaign of the, 19, of the 2016 um, election cycle, but whoever wins, and we hope it will be someone that has a very strong 
predilection to fighting for this issue, it will continue into the White House, it will continue up onto Capitol Hill, and that we will ultimately be successful in bringing transparency and equality in the process of our uh, public uh, policies in this United States of America. So thank you for the panelists, thank you for attending, and we look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you all so much. Please take your water bottle. You've certainly earned it. <laughs> and um, thank you, Richard, a colleague of mine, for convening this panel. Thank you all. Um, we hope that you took away from this uh, a reminder that this issue of money and politics, which can sometimes get a little bit abstract, few of us wake up in the morning thinking about campaign finance reform, but a lot of us wake up in the morning worrying about our energy and, and the cost of oil and climate change and health care and so on. And so we wanted to offer at least one of these issue panels to focus on the issues. And we hope that you will take away more than just this conversation, but go around to the tables uh, that surround the perimeter here, including there is one for the Pipeline Awareness Campaign, a campaign of grassroots citizens, much like the New Hampshire Rebellion, that is trying to push back against this pipeline. Um, so please take this chance to get involved.